Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, and... It's been a bad week for Yu-Gi-Oh! Okay, so we should probably talk about this Jess video, right? In a video uploaded earlier today, Jessica Robinson, a professional player from EU, revealed that she is stepping away indefinitely from competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! This comes on the coattails of at least a dozen professional players online, either through YouTube or Twitter, announcing that they're taking a hiatus for one reason or another. The reasons that Jessica describes in her video shouldn't be particularly shocking to anyone who takes the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game seriously. They're the same reasons that pros have been echoing for the past couple of years, the same reasons why we keep getting this perennial news cycle of people feeling frustrated and burnt out on the game, and they're the same reasons that Konami seems completely willing to ignore. Obviously, Jess's decision to step away from Yu-Gi-Oh! is her own decision, and I don't want to project any insecurities from the crowd upon her, but I think it's worth interrogating some of these larger reasons that keep cropping up and the mechanisms by which Konami could resolve them. And also, I mean, why I, I, I have no idea why they haven't. Like, that maybe is a question as well that should be answered. So let's begin with a little bit about Jess. Frequently, these Yu-Gi-Oh! is dying videos are easy to ignore. They come from individuals who picked up the game last week and were frustrated by how complicated it was. This is a pretty realistic perspective for new players, but it's important to recognize that it's not what's happening in this video. She has a ton of really impressive finishes over a ton of different years, and she's been in a ton of promotional material for the game, period. She's invested. This isn't some rando talking about how Yu-Gi-Oh! has gone woke because you can play as lesbian and VTubers, this is one of the game's best, clearly elucidating a really specific picture of why she's stepping away. So let's talk about the reasons. Firstly, Konami treats its top players really badly. <laughs> so Farfa, you can just turn off the video right now, but I want to draw a specific analog between Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering. In Magic the Gathering, household names are absolutely everywhere. The individuals you might be following on Twitter, you might be subscribed to on YouTube, who are crushing leagues and you're excited to see play on a main stage. Community figures are front and center in a lot of Watsi's branding, be they revealing new cards for sets, helping with commentary at events, or just generally keeping people engaged in the game that they all play together. Wizards of the Coast does a fair amount for its pro players. Now, before I get too many magic heads in the comments telling me that actually the pros are treated very poorly at Wizards of the Coast too, you have to understand where I'm coming from. I don't know about all of you, but as a child, I thought that a dream job would be making a living off of the winnings from card game tournaments. And even though Wizards of the Coast does provide winnings to individuals who make top cut at their events, certainly it's not enough to pay the bills. That's in direct contrast to Yu-Gi-Oh! where currently, if you do well at an event, you get almost nothing. Jess talks a lot about this in her video, but she punched her ticket last year to the Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship, meaning she was recognized as one of the top players in the world at the card game we all know and love. After wiping the floor with most Europeans, she went to the World Championship and wiped the floor with more individuals, getting a top eight finish at the literal most prestigious tournament in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history. And what did she get for doing so? Yeah, you know, nothing. She literally got nothing. In the video, she says she walked out empty-handed. This prizing scheme has been replicated time and time again in Yu-Gi-Oh! and it's truly frustrating. Did well at a local tournament? You're probably receiving your prizing in packs. No big deal, it's just locals. Did well at a regional? Well, I hope you enjoy a rubber mat and a deck box because that is what you're getting. Now that you've done well at a regional, you're headed to the national tournament where you can compete for another rubber mat and a deck box. Sure, Wizards of the Coast isn't super generous with their prize pool, but in Yu-Gi-Oh! the prize pool is non-existent. Usually individuals are fighting over a rubber mat and occasionally a Nintendo Switch which a seven-year-old console at this point. Now, I understand why a lot of people don't see a particular problem with this setup. It's one of the reasons why it's been widely reported that Kazuki Takahashi said something to the effect of he didn't want money coming into Yu-Gi-Oh! because it would make it feel like CD gambling in a basement somewhere. With the understanding that you can't play cards for a living wage, why would you even put money in the pot anyway? Just give people the clout of winning, which they can then translate into something sustainable by making videos about their deck profiles or something. But honestly, this is just completely at odds with the reality of modern cardboard. Board. Decks like Snake Eye Fiendsmith are creeping into the $2,000 range. If it costs an arm and a leg just to compete, shouldn't you get some sort of return on investment if you're willing to put in the effort to actually do well? And as for CD gambling, card games have just been normalized to the point where I don't think that's realistic. Lorcana, the game in which you cast Disney characters and sing songs together, gives out five digits of prizing to people for making top 64 at some events. As a result, there's very little incentive to push yourself as a pro player. Yes, you can stoke your own fires of self-determination, but the hours that you spend practicing the game are going to come at the realistic cost of your ability to hold down a job, relationships. To put in the effort necessary to be really good at this game, you have to make sacrifices somewhere. And when those sacrifices come at the benefit of quite literally no money whatsoever, it can be hard to say yes to it. The second reason that a lot of people are taking a break at present is because 
the format is really bad. <laughs> So if you haven't been following the last couple of months of Yu-Gi-Oh, here's a quick explainer. There's a singular deck, Fiendsmith Snake Eye, that's head and shoulders better than anything else. It isn't so dominant that it's risen to the level of tier zero, but it is extremely powerful. The other decks in the format are still playable, things like Tenpai and Yubel and Ritual Beast and Gimmick Puppet, but largely the non-Fiendsmith Snake Eye decks are not really playing Yu-Gi-Oh per se. Tenpai is a deck that benefits off of the fact that going second has been so bad for so long. Konami has printed some truly outsized going second tools. They get to load up on Raigeki's Dark Holes, Lightning Storms, and of course really powerful lingering effect hand traps like Mulcharmy and Dimension Shifter. Ritual Beast is another shifter deck that has also benefited from the recent and baffling unban of both Thunder Dragon Colossus in some corner cases, but mostly Arc Nemesis Protoss, which can call fire and win the game on turn zero. Gimmick Puppet FTK is just an FTK. There's like a legal FTK with tops at the YCS level this format. Why are we all okay with this? A lot of people are quick to blame the problems of this format on Fiendsmith Snake Eye, but I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I feel like it's the only deck in the format actually playing Yu-Gi-Oh. It's incredibly expensive, incredibly challenging, and the time that you spend learning the deck can be completely nullified by a tournament run in which an opponent just opens Shifter on you a whole bunch of times. Jess expresses frustration in the video with the state of things. She talks pretty directly about how the big names in the community, individuals who are consistently placing at events, really didn't at the last couple. That's because the way the format is structured, Fiendsmith Snake Eye is extremely powerful and extremely complicated. But the things that beat the strategy, things like Dimension Shifter, aren't too difficult to figure out how to use optimally. As a result, individuals spend a lot of time in this format preparing for scenarios that are never going to happen, because unfortunately, frequently you're going to sit across the table from your opponent, get outdrawn, and lose on turn zero to an effect that your opponent activated at the first possible opportunity. It's a weird scenario insofar as the best deck in the room requires a lot of skill to pilot effectively, but every other deck in the room requires almost no skill just the ability to outdraw your opponent. Unlike other formats, including some tier zero formats that I've been particularly outspoken about, the people who are doing well this format are largely professional players that are extremely skilled, but also individuals who have completely missed people who are one lottery ticket away from $1 million, opening Mulcharmy's shifter every game three. These two huge problems have coalesced into a kind of crisis. Professional players are feeling like their investment isn't being returned, both in terms of time, where their run can be stopped by an individual who is way less practiced than they are, and in terms of money, where they're investing a ton of cash into cardboard that isn't being reciprocated at all. As I've said in previous videos, this is in the face of a bunch of nascent card games that are promising a return on investment. I've been to bat for Elestrals a couple of times because I think it's fun, but it's hardly the only game in town. Lorcana has already attracted a significant amount of Yu-Gi-Oh's best. Christian Urena is posting about the Bucky Band. Dinka Fam can't go five minutes without talking about what song he's going to sing. And at base, I kind of can't blame him. I play Yu-Gi-Oh! because I think it is the literal best game in the world. But that doesn't mean that I don't spend some time at locals looking over at the tables of people playing One Piece and having a great time and thinking, is it that much better than its competitors? Is it worth putting up with a company that cares this little about the people playing the game just for like a 2% better play experience? And am I willing to sit through enough rounds of Shifter Mulcharmy to make up that difference? So with that all out of the way, let's talk about some potential solutions to this problem. First, let's talk about the prizing. This one's easy, just give us prizing. I know, I know, Kazuki Takahashi didn't want the game to include money as a form of prizing, but like there's other stuff you can do. For a very short period of time after events returned post-COVID, people were getting starlight sheets from the prize wall. How hard is that to give out to top performers? Sure, there is an additional transaction revolved where you have to contact someone on the secondary market who's looking, but those were going for like $20,000. Like that seems like a reasonable amount of money to win for like performing at the national tournament. In fact, the prize wall for side events is actually a pretty good indication of how you could actually reward people without just handing them cash. Why are giant cards not a consideration for main event? Why don't we have specialty prize cards tailored to event anymore? Hell, One Piece is doing this better than we are and they've been making a card game for six months tops. Not to repeat Jess's example, but the fact that an individual can be recognized as one of the top eight players on the entire planet and walk out of a tournament with nothing is embarrassing. And secondly, with respect to the format, there's no easy way out of this. Again, a lot of people want to put the blame on Snake Eyes and say, oh, well, Fiendsmith Snakes is so unbelievably powerful that we have to resort to these lingering hand traps that win the game for us with no input. But cards like Shifter are going to be good if Fiendsmith is in the format or not. It doesn't take a genius to recognize that if you ban some of the cards out of the top deck, the next six or seven best performing decks are still going to load up on tools like Evenly Matched. I think what needs to happen is on this upcoming ban list, instead of just hitting cards for power reasons, there needs to be a deliberate 
deliberate design philosophy behind it. I've talked about this a great deal on some of my ban list videos, but it's frustrating that it seems like ban list to ban list, there's no through line as to what Konami wants Yu-Gi-Oh to look like. Make a decision. Do you want lingering effects that are hard to track and require no skill whatsoever to activate to dominate? Do you want insanely complicated nuclear fusion style combos to reign supreme? Or do you want some secret third thing? A place where those lingering hand traps aren't specifically available to every deck. A place where there are a myriad of decks with different play styles, none of which feel frustrating to play against. I lived through Agob format. I know you can do it. At this point, unfortunately, curating a ban list so that such a format arises would require like upwards of 70 hits. I'm not just talking about like taking Flamberge out to pasture and putting shifter to one. Like you probably have to ban everything up to and including deck lockdown. Regardless, I think this is sort of a come to Jesus moment for Konami. I don't think the current direction of the card game is going to kill it, but it's going to take the individuals who are responsible for the most thought being put into the game, the professional players that largely dictate how the game is played even at a local level just by disseminating lists and information to become disinterested. And if that happens, the game is absolutely going to suffer. I think it's worth doing what we can to reward the people who are performing. Otherwise, they're all just gonna have to start YouTube channels to put food on the table. Or edit for another YouTuber. Uh, I made Top Cut at Euros, and all I have to show for it is this fucking mat. Cool. This video has been brought to you by top 64 EUWCQ competitor, Vladis. All right, that's it. Bye-bye.